this is a series of 10 lectures on foundations of physical law. And this one is going to be a gentle introduction. There's nothing technical in this lecture, it's about methodology. But I think it's absolutely essential that we get this right before we get onto the more technical issues. Because this is why we can do something different if we get a different methodology for it. Okay. So, if we're looking at this subject, we find that there are a lot of difficulties with it. It's rather risky to do this at all. Because the subject doesn't really have any status within physics at the moment. There's no obvious career structural financial support. Impact, of course, is negligible. No prizes. There's not even any journals, really. There's a journal called Foundations of Physics, but it's not really about this. It's about other things. And this is the most important of all. There's no protocols. There's no structure that's accepted from which you can start to work. And there are many people who think the, the subject shouldn't exist. Or they behave as though it shouldn't exist. So why should we do it at all, given all the problems? Well, because it really is as cutting edge as you can get. And this is why, this is why it's difficult to do. Because there's no systems in place. And it's not yet integrated into physics. But that's what I would like to do with it. I'd like to integrate it into physics. Make it a significant component of the subject. The problem with it is that in physics, we're always trying to push back to the origin from something more complicated. We start with a complicated world around us and we try to push back, project back and get to what might possibly be some sort of initial conditions, initial beginning of some sort. And so that, so we haven't got any basis on which we can start because we're trying to find the basis. So how could, we've got nothing from which we can start. So until we actually reach something more final, then we've got no basis because the final is the starting point and that's why it's difficult. And as we know, scientific method is mostly structured in the opposite direction. We've got starting points, for example, we have Maxwell's equations or quantum mechanics, and we start by building and explaining various things using it. But we can't do in this case. We've got to try and work the other way. So it's intrinsically difficult. <coughs> Yet, even though it's difficult, we should persist. And this is one of the reasons why we should persist. We've got the standard model of particle physics, a wonderful theory, brilliant. Magnificently successful, too successful for many people, because it seems to be keep the experts seem to keep reproducing the standard models' results and saying how good they are. And many people would like something to change, but it is only a model. It's never, it's never been a standard theory. It's not a theory. It's not a structure which explains it. It is a, it is a set of facts gathered into a structure, but it's not a fundamental structure. It doesn't start from some other place and explain why we get to the standard model. We've had this standard model since 1973. We've had no really major advance on explaining it in 40 years. So we've got to try to get to it from some other route. Or get to something from some other route. Now, what many people think we should do is a kind of combination. They say we should take quantum mechanics, we should take general relativity, the two most accepted theories we have, put them together somehow and make a bigger structure involving both. And I don't doubt that we should do that. I don't think that's the only thing we should do. There's something else we need to do. We need to ask other questions other than the questions that we would get by putting those together. If we truly want to reconcile them, we have to find foundations on which they are structured. Where do they come from? Because even if we were able to put them together successfully, which we haven't managed to do, we've still got to explain where they come from. There's still huge unexplained things within them. So, if we're looking at this subject, it isn't particle physics, it isn't general relativity, it's not quantum mechanics, and it's not any kind of extension or combination of them. 
it is a search for the explanations of such theories and everything that can explain uh, them in different ways. So we're looking for the common origins of physical theories, and their common origin with mathematics, and that's another big question we want to look at. We want to know about the, as Wigner said, Eugene Wigner said, the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in physics. Why, why do we use mathematics? Why is it so effective? And there's another side to that, because nowadays there's the unreasonable effectiveness of physics in mathematics, which is the reverse side of that. Because lots of mathematics is being produced only because of the physics that drives it. Now, if we were able to do that, if we were able to get at this level and get somewhere with it, make some head road into it, then we would be able to explain many things in other areas of physics, certainly classical physics, relativity, quantum mechanics, particle physics, maybe even other areas of science of greater complexity. Maybe we could extend to chemistry or biology or quantum uh, or computing science. But I say this is like finding the technological consequences of Blue Skies research. Wonderful if we do. Everybody is really pleased if we get a technological consequence of some Blue Skies research. We know that it always happens. And we're very happy to see it happen, but we know that's not why we're doing it. We're doing it because we want to find the answers to the Blue Skies questions. And again, we want to answer these foundational questions, so again we want to make head growth into these subjects as well. But that's not why we're doing it. So I'm going to say this is a separate discipline within physics. And that's the way we've got to look at it. That we're doing something different to what we've previously done. We've got to take on board all that we've previously done. We've got to accept all the physics we already accept. We've got to build that into our structure. But we've got to do something else as well. So we're not trying to replace anything we've got. We're trying to do something in addition to what we've got. And we will need all that as well. So we've got to do a completely separate way of thinking and methodology. It's, it's obvious that we have because we haven't made any head cross, So we've got to find another way of doing it. And I don't deny it's intrinsically difficult. And there's no formal description within the scientific method we can yet use for it. But it doesn't mean it can't be done. There is a thing that scientists have always used, and this is induction. So we infer a cause from given consequences. Now, we've got obviously got to use induction because that's what we're trying to do. We're in try trying to infer the cause from consequences. But when we're studying this area, we've actually got to take the induction to a much more extreme level than we normally do. We've got to use a lot more induction. And this is because the causes are more general than the ones we usually investigate. So we've got to be more imaginative. We've got to be more wide-ranging. So our training tells us to deduce certain consequences from what we have and then then sometimes to induce something from them and push back a little. Carefully limited induction, but well, we've got to be a little less limited when we do this kind of induction. We've got to think outside the box more than we would normally do. The box being physics that we've been taught to understand it. Not that we have got any objection to that, no we haven't, that's great, fantastic, but we've got to find something which is additional to it. And at first sight, it may look different. And it, it ought to be simpler, because that's the way nature always works, from simplicity to complexity, not the other way. But it ought to eventually automatically give us the familiar structure when we make the right connections. So that's what we've got to do. We've got to get something that looks different from what we've normally done, but that will give us what we've normally done and lead to it. So that's the only way we could possibly make progress in this area. Now, it's clear that we can't just randomly speculate. It's no use at all. Completely pointless. That won't get us anywhere. What we need is to actually say, what protocols are we going to use? What kind of structure are we going to start from? And I say we actually need a theory of knowledge that's even more fundamental than the knowledge we want to generate. 
So our theory of knowledge has got to lead to the new knowledge. It's not. If we don't have the right theory of knowledge, we won't get anywhere. It's a philosophy, if you like, and a metaphysics in the sense that it's a subject that talks about physics, which is what meta of anything means. But perhaps it might even need to be a metaphysics in the usual sense of that word. Now, it is a philosophy, but it's not philosophy as usually talked about. We're not talking about the, the, the nature of quantum mechanics in the, in the ordinary sense. We're not talking about whether there's a god or not. We're not talking about philosophy of physics either, the, the sort that talks about uh, Schrodinger's cat and such things. We're not talking about that kind of thing. We're not talking about philosophy of science. Philosophy of science is the sort of subject which says how does science operate. <coughs> Those are all interesting subjects, but that's not what we're doing. What we're doing is philosophy of knowledge. <coughs> we have to have a philosophy of knowledge. And we have to have one strictly geared to our specific purpose of looking at the foundations of physical law. And this is, is not, there's, there's no point in coming out with generalizations and, and that kind of thing. We've got to be very focused in what we're doing. It's got to be highly technical. We've got to find those more fundamental principles of knowledge which will help us to choose fundamental principles for physics. And then say, <coughs> yes, that's the kind of thing we want. We can recognize them. That's what we've got to do. We've got to find some way of doing that. There's, there's no hope whatsoever of saying, well, I'm going to sit down and design such a philosophy of knowledge. You couldn't possibly do that. No one's ever been able to do that. The only thing you can do is do a symbiotic process. You look at physics, and then you do a little bit of that, and then you look at physics again and do a bit more of that. And it's got to be a symbiotic feedback, positive feedback mechanism to keep developing one with the other. Then, if then, oh, and only then, can we start codifying the principles for use in other cases. Right. Now, this is the sort of thing that I've been involved with for quite a long time. So I'm going to uh, tell you, how, you know, what I've managed to develop in this area, so that we can see if that would lead to anything of interest. And the first question I'm going to ask is. How is it that we can develop a picture of the world which is completely different from the way that the physicist we know it is? Because our picture of the world is based on something that's 15 orders of magnitude bigger than the proton. And the proton itself is a complex structure. So how, how did we manage to do that? Our environment is completely different from the environment at the fundamental level of physics. So how can we actually understand it at all? So there are things that are complex, um, which, which are very familiar to us, but don't actually help us to do that. So how, how can we do it? Well, there's only, one, there's only one capacity that we have that can do that. There's only one t talent that we really have. Complexity leads to emergent properties not seen at a less complex level. And a classic one is solidity. Or solid table, this solid matter. Everybody thinks that's solid matter in, in the normal way of thinking. But of course we know it isn't. We know that it's all about points, interacting points point particles, there's no solid solidity whatsoever. Solidity is an emergent property. That for centuries we thought that was one of the most certain things that we knew about solidity, but it isn't in fact anything more than an emergent property. It's not a fundamental one. Of course, explaining how we get that emergent property is an interesting thing in itself, but it's not what we're looking for. So we've been deceived. It seems to us normal to consider solidity. But we have been deceived. And in fact, there's a famous story by, by the 18th century writer Samuel Johnson, who somebody said, What do you think about the philosophy of, of Berkeley, that everything is um, all abstract and so forth? And he, he, he kicks a stone and said, Thus I refute Berkeley, because a stone is a solid object. So that is com the common sense view is that stone is solid, but we know that it isn't. There's no such thing as solid matter. 
and substance. So it's only an emergent property, and there's no such thing as an extended object. As far as we know, there are only points. So material objects, so-called, are just an interacting point in otherwise empty space. So we've got to find out what is, how, how, how we can get around this. So how do we manage to develop our view that we've got points in interacting space and not something solid? How do we get there? Well, we got there because we used the one talent we have, which is pattern recognition. We had to have pattern recognition to survive it in the in earlier states of uh, human existence. We not they not survive without recognizing predators and other other patterns that they needed to recognize to survive. So we've evolved to be able to recognize patterns, and of course not just us, but other species as well. Now, f interestingly, nature seems to reuse the same patterns at different levels of complexity. It's a kind of self-similarity. Perhaps it's related to a fractal concept, but there is a sort of self-similarity in nature where the same sort of pattern emerges at different levels. And we can use patterns we've learned at our level down at lower levels. And that's worked very well. And so also, we can also recognize when the pattern doesn't recur. So that's two aspects to pattern recognition. We've got, yes, that's an existing pattern. Oh, yes, that breaks the pattern. That's not the same. And we're good at doing both of those things. Now, mathematics is a classic example of self-similarity. So we can use the same mathematics at many levels. And that's a re recurring pattern that we can use all the time. Yeah. That's, that's the classic example of it. And naturally, pattern recognition is one of the key aspects of thinking outside the box. You recognize a pattern, you say, I've seen that before, or that looks like such and such, and you can bring your knowledge in one area to bear in another. Now, clearly mathematical structures are at the heart of physics. Without mathematics, we wouldn't have the physics we have. We know that it must be mathematical. But somehow, there must be a transition from relative simplicity at foundational level to more highly developed levels, to more complex structures at high, higher de developed levels. And we must see how that happens. We must try to observe that transition and get there. A highly complex, this is very important in my view, a highly complex mathematical model can't be a foundational one. It can be brilliantly successful to explaining many things, but it isn't foundational. Uh, I hate to mention Ptolemy's epicycles, but Ptolemy's epicycles were brilliantly successful doing what they did. And no one would deny that for centuries they were the classic way of working out where planets and so, were and so forth. But they're not the, they're the, but they're not the real answer, they're not the foundational answer. So that's very clever. Brilliant mathematics, but it's not the foundational <coughs> answer. Somehow, nature isn't clever in that way, at the foundational level. Our cleverness and nature's are different. So we mustn't assume that nature follows our, our cleverness. We must try to find out what nature's cleverness is. And it's different. So we must find some way, if we use simpler so-called, they might not actually be simple at all, but the simpler mathematical structures must have a natural progression to the more complex ones we use that we're already familiar with. So we've got to find mathematical structures that are simple, but that lead to the more complex ones that we're going to use in a, at a later stage. Now, People often say mathematics is a tool used in physics, and I would dispute that utterly, because it is a tool used in physics, but it isn't just that. It's built into the structure intimately. They're, they're, they're totally connected at the basis level that you can't separate them. There's something about mathematics which is essential to physics and, and vice versa. They're not separate subjects, they're part of the same thing. And it isn't just that, oh, it happens to be convenient, People often say mathematics, mathematical equations are convenient, but they're not. 
the ones we use in physics aren't convenient at all. They're, they're very inconvenient because we often use differential equations of which there's no obvious solution. It's not a simple solution. You have to then stick in initial conditions and all kinds of things to actually get any kind of approximate solution out of them. So that isn't convenient. We're not doing it because it's convenient. We're doing it because it's the correct structure to use. So the mathematics must be deeply built into the structures physics needs for its foundations. And always the progression should be from simplicity at low levels to complexity at high levels, never the other way. So if we come up with a complex, brilliant equation, then I don't think that's going to be foundational. It, it could be fantastically useful, but it won't be foundational. It won't look like that at all. So I don't think explaining complex systems using complex mathematics will actually help us to understand foundations. However, there is something that will help us that we have become much more familiar with over, over recent years, certainly in the last century. So one particularly significant type of pattern has become of immense significance. And this is giving us a very strong indication of how a mathematics can start from something simple, seemingly anyway, and lead to something which is obviously complex. And this is symmetry. And uh, it's in every, it's all about us in the laws of physics everywhere. There's all kinds of symmetries. So symmetry is absolutely fundamental to physics. We see it in the fundamental interactions, fundamental particles. We see it in other areas. We see it in biology. We see it everywhere. So symmetry is clearly a key to this. If we get a symmetry, we can help to decomplify, decomplexify our explanations. And we might get a more profound understanding than we would if we had a complex explanation. We also know that some symmetries are <coughs> broken. And this is really quite a big clue to us that some symmetries are broken. Uh, we believe that under certain conditions that what would look like a perfect symmetry no longer does so. And that, that does give us a clue because that tells us how things are complexifying that, that leads us on to how we can get to complexity from simplicity. The reason can't be arbitrary. You can't just, nature just happens to have a broken symmetry. That, that couldn't possibly be true. Nature doesn't do that kind of thing. If it has symmetry, it has proper symmetry. The broken symmetry comes from some other thing. It's, if we have a broken symmetry, then, then that will not be fundamental. We know that if it's broken, it's not at a fundamental level. Na nature would never act in such an arbitrary way. It is a sign of complexity or emergence. And if we can find the source of that breaking, then we can work out how that complexity has come from the simplicity. So that's a fantastic clue if we've got a broken symmetry. It's a really helpful clue. And avoiding the arbitrary is going to be a cardinal principle. And by this I mean is that you, if you believe in physics, you can't say, well, physics works up to this point, and then we stop using it. You know that you can't do that. If you, if, if you go for physics, you've got to go for it forever, all the way. There's no point at which it stops working. You can't have explanations which, for which, at which point physics ends. Can't be done. No such thing. It has to be the top and final explanation. It has to be physics, ultimately. And it has to be true without exception when you get to that level. If you believe in its unqualified truth, that gives you a strong way of, that gives you a strong uh, thing that uh, you can use for regulating your theorizing. You believe in its unqualified truth. And that's why physics is so powerful, because we believe in its unique strength, its unqualified truth as an explanation of the universe. There isn't another explanation, there's only physics. We may not have got to that physics, but we know that it has to be like that. There can't be anything else. And in, at, I'm just going to say at this level, what I have found from my own experience is that if we decide we've got a correct direction, we have to go for it. We haven't got to compromise. We've got to go for it, ultimately, 
So I'm going to push down that direction. My hunch is that it's there and go for it. Utterly ruthless in pushing it to its limits. If for example, and this is a very important point, it, physics in its foundations has to be totally abstract. And this is what quantum mechanics will tell us. There's no sort of material bit and an abstract bit, there's only an abstract bit. There isn't both. So there aren't tangible objects and purely abstract concepts. Space and time, like, like space and time, you can't have both. It's like, it's like having gods and humans in a story. It can't work. You can only have one thing or the other. It, it's illogical to have two different types of explanation together if, if at a foundational level. So we have to go for the abstract. Everything must be. And I was mentioning about point like particles before. And the evidence that we got from experimental results on point like particles suggests that the true reality is the abstraction. There isn't anything more real than that. That's all there is. There's only abstraction. In a way, it's mathematics. There's no, nothing else. Tangibility is only an emergent property of high level complexity. There isn't anything real or tangible. It's just pure abstraction. And only this abstraction will bring about the link with mathematics that we desire. If we don't do that, we, we can't 100% link with mathematics like we need to. Now what I'm going to say is that quantum mechanics is not a calculating device. People talk about quantum mechanics, oh I don't like quantum mechanics because it doesn't give me the world I'm familiar with. It gives me this set of equations which I can calculate. That's great, I can get my calculations right. That to me is no good. We've got to accept quantum mechanics for what it is. Quantum mechanics is real explanation. It's not a calculating device it only, it is more than that. It's an exact indication of the way physics should go. It's giving us the clue. Instead of saying quantum mechanics is a problem, as many people do, we should say, no, oh, hell, that's giving us the opportunity. That's what it should be like. It should be strange like that. It should be abstract. That's giving us the clue where we've got to go. It's not only what physics is like, it's what it should be like. It ought to be like that. It ought to be have that kind of strangeness. And we need to look for something that is really simple, yet can generate complexity. If we start with, um, say for example, as a string theorist, one ten-dimensional structure. That's, and I'm not saying you can't get anything out of that. Uh, you certainly can. You can get plenty out of that kind of thing, and lots of good <coughs> ideas. And I will be mentioning some of them later. But if you go, if you start with that, then you've no idea how this breaks up into simpler component parts. We know that there are simpler parts in nature. We know that we observe three-dimensional space, that we've got time, which is something else, and that we've got other ideas. How do we get that ten dimensions breaking down into something else? That's simpler. Well, we can't, if that's a starting point. So that kind of thing is okay as a complexity, as an emergent thing, but it's no good as a starting point. So this is not the way we, could, we should start. We've got to have something that we, can't, we, we, we can break, that we can't break down any further. And something like a ten-dimensional space-time with lots of complexity is not something that is fundamental and simple. If, if there are ten dimensions, as the string theorists would say, then we should find them by working out how this complexity emerges from something simpler. We shouldn't start with that. And in this, the structures of the components will be diverse in origin and the brokenness will be because we put them together to make this ten dimensional structure. That's where we get broken symmetries from. We don't get them at the fundamental level. So we can't just say, ah, there's some concept of symmetry breaking which does this. I don't think there is any such thing as symmetry breaking in that sense. What we have is broken symmetries are certainly a symmetry complexity. We put things together and that's why it looks like a broken symmetry. 
not because we had a perfect symmetry and it broke by some mysterious mechanism. Uh, we've got to abandon all models. We don't want anything that's model dependent whatsoever. At the fundamental level models are completely useless. Models are fantastic at most levels of physics. And we, we need them because complex things are too difficult to do without them. But at the foundational level, then we don't want them. We want pure abstraction. We want absolute minimalism. And abstraction is a, is a good example of minimalism. We want to use Occam's razor as much as we can. The, the idea that uh, that idea is most likely to be correct, which makes the fewest assumptions. We go for that as much as we can. Not always easy, but that's what we've got to do. We, are, we all want an abstract reason, everything there just for an abstract reason, and we don't want anything that's complexity driven. What I call the story big book picture. We don't want any of that. We want pure abstraction, we want simplicity, mathematics. Okay, let's go on to the next concept that we need. So let's suppose we've removed everything except physics. So anything that's not physics is out the window. We've removed everything from physics except abstraction. So we can now start from the extra abstractions. Well, no we can't. We've got to apply the principle of minimalism to the abstract ideas themselves. Is nature, if we have a number of abstract ideas, let's say we got space and time and stuff like that, is that good enough? No, it's not going to be good enough. It's not going to be good enough because it's not fundamental enough. Is nature at the foundational level characterized by them? No. Even the abstract concepts, simple as they are, are too arbitrary to be accepted as fundamental principles. They're not fundamental principles. The only possible statement we could make and be sure that we would be right is that nature can't be characterized. It has no defining characteristics. If we want to avoid anything arbitrary, then nature can't have any defining characteristics. We can't say it's all measurable, it's all discrete, it's all continuous, it's all conserved. We can't say anything like that. We can never apply any principle which is true to the whole of nature. It can't be done. Well, is there any principle which can encapsulate this? Well, yes. This is the principle that I believe that we have to accept. This is the metaphysical principle that we have to accept without question if we want to go further. And if we do so, I think we start getting results. And this principle says the universe and everything within it, including all the conceptualizing we can do about it, is absolutely nothing whatsoever. The totality is zero. There is nothing which does not have some thing which causes the zero. It's the only position that makes logical sense. It's the only concept that we can imagine that wouldn't be arbitrary if one explained, because it's impossible to explain. Now people say, why, how is it that we see something around us if, if the totality is zero? Well, we see something around us because we're in it. If we're in it, then we get a distorted picture of the totality because we can't see the totality. You'd have to be outside it to see it as zero. There's a mathematical example I often use, which is you've got the number one, and you write that in binary, and it's one symbol, the zero and one. We know that mi the minus one is needed to cancel it to zero. So one and minus one are dual concepts, they're symmetric. But if we try to write minus one in binary, we realize we've got no symbol for it. And what we do, in practical as well as theoretical terms, is write an infinite string of ones. 
we write an infinite string of ones. And if we add one at one end, you go one and one is one zero carrying one, zero, 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 and you see them all topple down like a set of dominoes. So all the ones become zeros, so we have an infinite string of zeros if we add one to that infinite string of ones. And so we can do minus one, and it's of course a practical use in, in building computers and doing software and so on so forth. So we can actually do that. But because we've only got one symbol, because we define from within the system, we can't see what it looked like outside. We have no symbol for minus one. So even though one and one cancel to zero, they don't look a bit alike. One and minus one don't look a bit alike. They look completely different. So symmetry there is distorted because of the looking it from one perspective. Sorry, how do you know the universe is actually like that? Well, you have to guess. You don't? Yes. yes, of course I said it's a metaphysical principle. I don't know yet. I've, I've got to guess that it is. It, it, you've got to be inductive. You've got to think outside the box. You may be hopelessly wrong. But what I've found is if you are hopelessly wrong, you find out pretty quickly. Because everything starts going wrong straight away if you, if you make a wrong assumption. However, if you're on the right lines, then you realize there's one or two little awkward bits gradually you look at those and then say, oh no, the, those awkward bits work out. So you, you just got to do that. I can only say that to you because I've been through this process. I couldn't say it if I was starting from scratch. But as I'm not starting from scratch, I can say that I found that works for me. Okay. And this totality zero, anyway, is, is not uncommon in that the concept is not completely outside of physics as we know it now. It's, it's beginning to creep in anyway. Richard Feynman, for example, pointed out the negative gravitational energy of the, of the Hubble universe effectively cancels out the positive mass energy. And he, saw, he thought that was quite extraordinary. It costs nothing to create a new particle since we can create it at the center of the universe but it will have negative gravitational energy equal to minus, uh, to m tot c squared. And this is a great mystery, but he's talking about the top energy in the universe being zero. Cosmologists often talk about starting the universe from nothing. Here, we, here we're, we're not only starting from nothing, it's still nothing. But if you start from nothing, you end up with nothing. But you wouldn't know it. Uh, you, you couldn't just guess such a thing. You'd have to have some hunch of course we got hunches. This is science writer Peter <coughs> Atkins. The seemingly something is elegantly reorganized nothing and the net content of the universe is nothing. I know Peter Atkins' books are used by the chemistry department quite a lot. So he's a well-known author. So he finally says that chemistry is nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so is physics unfortunately. <laughs> but we need to tell them that. <laughs> and even in classical physics we're very familiar with ideas like the total force in the universe must always be zero. That's what Newton's third law is. And that's what everything that derives from it or is related to it says. To everything zero, a whole lot. And of course, we, we're quite familiar with doing that. It doesn't mean that locally we see nothing, we don't. We all, we all see something locally, but totally we see nothing. And there's actually a symmetry about that third law as well, isn't it? Because you imagine the, the yeah. vectors and they're images of each other, aren't they? Well, they are. And the, the remarkable thing about Newton's third law isn't what people think it is. It's not body A acts on body B, body B acts on body A. It's body A acts on the rest of the universe. The rest of the universe acts on body B. And that already is an asymmetry because, because the body A, sorry, the rest of the universe ba acts back on body A. Body A is localized, whereas the rest of the universe is everywhere. And so already we see, even though it's symmetric in the sense that the total force is zero, it's also asymmetric in another sense. <coughs> so the need to make everything total exactly zero would explain why symmetry is so important. It's obvious why symmetry is so important if you need totality zero. That's why we would get symmetry. And in, in this case, we're looking at a particular kind of symmetry, which is duality. 
There are other symmetries which we're interested in, but at this moment we're talking about duality. And this provides a clear way of getting totality zero, yet having something happen. And of course, this is another example, conservation of momentum. You have start with zero momentum, you end up with zero momentum, but you've got two objects flying in opposite directions. And it's still zero momentum. Duality in what sense? Um, well, it cancels to zero, in effect. You, you've got plus and minus, if you like, plus one, minus one. C2, the C2 group. Yeah, that sort of duality. Now, I was, I was saying, if we want to make it a general principle, we have to realize that it's not going to be obvious how this zeroing happens. It's a subtle foundational zeroing. It's not obviously everything goes to nothing. We can see in some of the examples we've used, like Newton's third law and so on, it doesn't mean nothing happens. Plenty happens, but it's still zero force. So apparent asymmetry or symmetry breaking will come with complexity. And we have to justify this, and we will. We will justify this statement. But I can't justify it today, but I will justify it later. When we look at how complex systems develop from simpler abstract ones. At the moment, let's just accept that this is a principle which we're going to act, uh, believe applies at the founda foundational level without exception, without any exception whatsoever. Like physics, it must apply without exception. We've got to find those principles which always apply. And this, we believe, is one. So, we've now got a, a beginning to get the methodology in place. Foundational ideas have to be simple, symmetrical, mathematically based, minimal, totally abstract, and combined to zero totality. <coughs> and we have to apply these conditions rigorously, ruthlessly, and in all cases without exception. We've got to get an, a method that works in every single case. There should be nothing arbitrary whatsoever in the picture. And this is a very important point. If we find such a structure as we can do this with, then it must be totally exclusive. In other words, there must be nothing else other than that. Everything must be within it somehow. And that's a very, very significant point. If we make things totally exclusive, that adds a very, very powerful constraint to our thinking. Yeah, can I ask a question? Isn't yeah. it like totally against Gödel's incompleteness law, which is like as mathematical as it can get? Um, yeah, but Gödel's laws are based on assuming the number series. One, yeah. two, three. We haven't assumed that yet, and I will talk about that in the final lecture. But I can't talk about it today until okay. I've done some other things. The Gödel's exclusion law works as we understand mathematics today. Yeah. But that is based on the already assuming the number series to exist. So we should uh, invent a new sort of mathematics as well, then? Possibly. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's not new in the sense that the mathematics is unlike existing mathematics, but it might explain a little bit more foundational structure in mathematics we should perhaps invent as well. And as, as I say, physics and mathematics come together. We're not going to have physics separate from the mathematics. It's going to have to come out at the same time. Okay. So I'm saying we've got strict protocols now. And I wouldn't, I mean, we could make up any protocols we wanted. And if they didn't work, there'd be no use. I want to show in the remaining talks that they do work that we can actually be begin to make headway in this subject because these protocols do work. But if we didn't have them, I don't think we would make that headway. Now, I want to build up towards the, the third lecture. The second lecture will be on some mathematics we need. But this lecture here, uh, I want to build up towards the third one to, to start looking at how we're going to work on physics. So we want to exclude everything extraneous to, to reduce the options to the only ones that are compatible with these protocols. 
And this strictness is absolutely essential as we're reaching the absolute limit of what it is conceivable to know. I think we can actually go to lower levels, but it's no longer recognizable as physics. I'll hope to talk about that in the final lecture. This is only the first step. We haven't apply, established what the protocols will apply to. And this is what we've got to do now. What concepts? We've got to look for what we might think the most primitive physical concepts. We've got a fairly good idea, because we've already done this for many years, perhaps even centuries. So we've got a fairly good idea of the kind of things that are the most primitive ones. But we've got to get a strict set of such concepts that we can use. Now, we, 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 if we go back to our idea that the whole human development of science is only possible because we can recognize repeated patterns, let's go back to the way we have done science up till now and are still doing it and still will do it. We go to deeper and deeper levels and we look for patterns that we've seen before and we reapply them and see that they apply there and they don't apply there and, and so on. So descending from the large scale complex structures to increasingly small scale less complex ones, it seems that certain concepts are necessary at all levels. Nobody's ever really got away from needing space and time. Others on the other hand Solidity and materiality, as we've seen, are emergent and disappear. So we obviously don't need them. So it suggests that the repeated concepts are the ones that should appear at most primitive level as well. While the ones which are not repeated, we can exclude. If we put forward this kind of analysis, we can create a provisional set of primitive concepts which we can't break down any further, and we've, we've done this in different ways for a long time, but we need to do it in a stricter and more subtle way. The full account will go in, be in the third lecture. However, I want to mention a couple of things at this point. Obviously, <coughs> we include space and time. I say we don't include space time, though we will want to get to space time, because space time is emergent. If it weren't emergent, we couldn't explain why we got space and time. And space and time in quantum mechanics don't behave the same. We need to combine them in a complex structure, but the fundamental structure needs them separate. And certainly curved space time is even more emergent. But these emergent properties should emerge from our more primitive ones. We must represent matter in its point-like state, perhaps, and something else, perhaps energy or connection between them. It may be that these aren't the correct concepts, but we find that out by testing it out. We've got to start somewhere, and then as we proceed through, we'll find out which they are. And there must be some way in which, at the foundation level, these abstract concepts are delivered all at once. So somehow, we can't have these as separate things, we must package them because that is how we get our totality zero if we package them. And if we package them, that may explain the growth of complexity in the way we do it. So we've got to find out a way of doing that. Now, whatever we find at the first stage won't look like physics immediately as we know it. It's Think of it as an embryo type of physics. An embryo doesn't look like a human being, but there are certain indications that a human being is on the way. So this is a kind of embryo, or a cluster of cells perhaps. It's not, it won't yet be physics as we know it. But as we unravel the complexity, we ought to see that familiar physics should appear, and with great, greater clarity than we previously had. And if it doesn't, then we've gone down the wrong track. So we have to see whether it does. A people have long thought some great complex equation will hold all of nature's secrets. And as I've said a number of times, nature doesn't work like that. No great complex equation 
would be anything but arbitrary. We've got to have something that's not arbitrary. The primitive structure has to be mathematical, but it's not an equation. And its secrets will have to be wrung out of it. They won't be obvious. Some of them might become obvious, but many will not. You just have to keep working at them and develop out of the complexity. So this is the primitive embryonic level. I actually tried to invent a German word, but I'm justified in doing that, and O-theory, a sort of pre-theory, if you like. And we need a lot of inductive thinking to do this. We've got to sort of go straight to the, to the X-ray analysis of what we're doing. Go through all the layers of complexity, if we can. Maybe we can't, but we've got to try. That's what we've got to aim to do. Because we've got very severe criteria, and we've got, we will have an exact mathematical basis, we'll have to we'll expect it to ensure it's rigorous. And then perhaps we can start answering a few questions which we've never been able to get anywhere near. What are these things? What are things? What are these things? Why is space as we observe it three-dimensional? Why does time never run backwards? Everybody thinks these are deep philosophical questions. I think they're deep primitive physics questions and we could look at it from that point of view. And if, if we're getting anywhere near it, then we should be able to start having some idea about how to answer such questions. Okay, let me just say, point out a few acknowledgements. So this is a long-term research project, and if I, people want more details, there's the book Zero to Infinity, published by World Scientific, 2007. And I'm saying that I started off as a solitary worker a long time ago, but I've had some several collaborations, and there'll be occasional things in these lectures which I've done with one or other of these collaborators. I will mention it if when I have. Uh, I also like to mention the support from some quite a number of members of Liverpool's physics department, especially from Mike and John, who've, who've uh, been particularly helpful in setting up this uh, series. Okay, got a few minutes for a few questions. The, the next, the next lecture will be more mathematical, but that will deal with the mathematics we need. And the third lecture is a really key lecture. If you, if, if, if you're going to come to any, come to the third and fourth. You need the second as well. Yeah, to understand. Yeah, I mean, are the notes and things available? Yes, there are, there's a, a set of notes for each lecture, and I hope to make them available on the web. Perhaps well, one of you guys who knows how to do that sort of thing can, can help me out with that. Yeah. Yeah. You can also have the slides, and there will also be film of, of, the, uh, of the lecture. Yeah. So we need to organise setting up a web place yeah. for this stuff. That yeah. And, and of course I'm here all the time so people can ask any questions they want. And we need to fix up, I mean, people have to agree on a sort of schedule. Yeah, the next lecture is in a week's time. Do you want to play it like that every lecture? Or do you no, I would have done one on Monday if, if, uh, if it had been possible, but there's uh, too, too much going on this Monday with... Uh, uh, yeah, no, there's lots of things going on this Monday so I can't do it. So do you want to plan it like that each week? Or, you know, yeah, I... I there will be four before Easter, and then, we, then yeah. we'll have a three-week break and come back after Easter. Uh, the four that will be before Easter will be uh, as important as any anyway, so yeah. if, you, if you go to those four, you'll get the basic idea of what it's about. It's Friday the 15th of March, yeah. That's the next one, same time, same place. Yeah. Yeah. It looks like we can all fit in here, so that's good. Okay. Um, and the, the next lecture will be, as I say, mathematics. We need special, not special mathematics, but mathematics which may not be familiar. It's not particularly difficult, but it may not be familiar to, to people, so we need to do it. It's not difficult, though, I can assure you. But it's, you're better off with the, the screen version because I'm going to use colour coding for a lot of the symbols to make it a lot easier. Yeah. <coughs> so we applaud at the end of the 10 lectures. <laughs> <laughs> Please yourself. Yeah. Thank you.